So we're going to get into statics here. And uh, some of this is going to be review from uh, 122 that you've already taken. And uh, it's actually a lot of it's going to be review. But this is essentially our one day of review. So you know, then we'll get into new stuff after this today. But I figure it's good to start with some stuff that's really important for this class. And we'll go ahead and get into it. So who remembers the characteristics of a force? What you got? OK. A direction. Usually we number that as number two, but uh, okay, direction. Okay, and there's a reason I have this little picture here. Uh, the, the presumption is that maybe a rope might tie onto an eye bolt or something like this, and uh, the, the direction of the force can be represented basically by a vector that we put on here, and the, uh, the line of that vector can be called the direction, right? It's got a direction associated with it. Okay, so that's good. Um, when we talk about direction, does direction have much meaning just all by itself? Okay, what, is, what do you have to be referencing when you talk about direction? Oh, there's another a characteristic some of you are, are muttering here, and, and it's uh, magnitude. Okay, that is how hard you're pulling or pushing, right? So it's, and that's usually associated when you're talking about a vector like this, that's associated with the length of the vectors, how hard you're pulling or pushing. But back to the idea of the direction. Does the direction have any meaning just all by itself? Okay, it's got to have some kind of a reference, more than a reference point, it's a, it's a reference frame, right? It's what space is this thing in and is, is there something that you kind of consider to be up or, or horizontal or something? It's with respect to some sort of a reference frame. That direction has to be defined. And often the way that is done practically is, uh, you know, in a lot of our problems, it's going to be happening on Earth, presumptively, right? And uh, so a lot of times we'll let that be one of the directions. It's sort of up and down, the direction of gravity, okay, which makes another direction horizontal, because usually the way we define our directions, we define it as, say, axes that are all perpendicular to each other. All right? So that's good. And the direction now has meaning as a, it can be like an angle relative to this reference frame. Okay? So something like this, that, that direction might be defined as an angle. Okay? Relative to the uh, coordinate axes there. Um, is that the only way to talk about the direction of the force? Could be positive or negative, but do we always have to use an angle? Okay, a slope is another way of getting at the same idea. You can talk about something like the rise and the run, right? You can say for this thing, there's a certain amount of run and a certain amount of rise. Uh, anyone in here ever been like a, a carpenter? Okay. When you talk about the pitch of a roof, how do you how do you talk about the pitch of a roof? Have you ever heard like something like a five twelve? Okay, it's a really interesting thing. Carpenters talk about the pitch of a roof, you know, a roof on a house or whatever. They talk about the pitch of that usually, and they refer to it with a number and then twelve. What do you think they're talking about? It's basically how many inches of rise for every foot of run. Right? So if they talk about a 512 roof, it means there's five inches of rise for every foot of run. And that's the way they typically specify the pitch of a roof. Right? So that's an example of a real world location where you would use a slope to talk about kind of the direction of something. And there's a lot of other ones as well, but that's a, an example. Okay? So we have uh, our magnitude, we have our direction. The magnitude is associated with the length of the vector, if we're talking about doing this thing in a strict geometric way. And then the, uh, you know, the direction can be specified with an angle or with a slope, and there might be some other ways too. And what's our third characteristic of the force? They're not just two, 
Although these two that we just talked about, those happen to be the characteristics of the mathematical item known as a vector, which is why we use vectors to talk about these things. But there's another aspect of a mathematical vector that we need to think about when we're talking about statics problems that you may or may not think about so much uh, when you're talking about vectors in mathematics. Point of, application. Point of application. Forces don't just exist sort of somewhere, right? Forces are applied to a particular place, right? And so we're going to put that down as the third item here is this point of application. And you might notice that in a lot of the problems that I write, I very seldom will just show a force out in the middle of nowhere not attached to something, right? And the reason I don't like to do that is that that's not the way forces really work. A force has to be applied to something in order for it to sort of have a meaning, okay? So those are good, good things there. Now let's talk about adding forces. And let's start with a super easy case first. What, how would you go about taking, let's say, two forces that were applied to a, an, an eye bolt or something like this? You know, say you've got an eye bolt here, and uh, I, I have one person who's pulling on this eye bolt horizontally with some amount of force. I'll call it F1. Someone else decides to come and help and pull on it as well, and they pull in the exact same direction. And this other person, maybe, you know, maybe it's me and my kid. You know, so my kid comes over and puts F2 on there because they always want, they, you know, kids, they always want to help their parents, you know, which is really sweet. But they both pull, me and my kid, we're pulling the same amount or same direction on here with different amounts of force. What's the net effect? Yeah, so it's not tricky, right? All you have to do is just add these two magnitudes together. If F1 is 10 pounds and F2 is 5 pounds, how much force is being pulled with on there? 15 pounds, right? Pretty simple. Why is it so simple? Because they're in the same direction, okay? What if they're not in the same direction? Okay, I hear a lot of you talking about you can try to get this thing into particular kind of components. Let's start before that. Let's start with the really big idea of how, how do you think about these things working. And uh, I'll say they add, if you're going to do this graphically, since we have this nice graphical representation now with vectors to represent forces, if you're going to do this graphically, you can use something called the, uh, you know, the head to tail. Oop, not heat, head to tail method. And how does that work? Okay, you have these two forces, F1 and F2, that are both applied to this piece. But what you do, you do is you say, I'm going to grab that one and imagine instead of thinking of it right there, I'm going to say, actually, what I'm going to do is copy it. And that bothers some people sometimes when I use this, uh, this method because you can't necessarily do that on your piece of paper. But I put it on there, and what does that give me? I put the tail of the of F2 on the head of F1, and what's that? Okay, how do I get the resultant though from that? Okay, so you put the tail of a new vector at the starting point, and you extend it out to the end of the last one as the finishing point. That is the sum of vector F1 and F2. So that's a, that's a graphical representation of what that vector sum is. It's not just adding F1 and F2 because they're not in the same direction. Notice here that uh, it doesn't matter which one you move. I could just as easily have uh, grabbed this vector right here, right, and copied that one. All right, and put it up here. And there's another uh, name for this thing, and it's based on what I just did right here. Some people call this the parallelogram rule. Okay. 
But I think it's important to start here with our understanding of, uh, of how these, this vector addition works because this is actually what allows us to think properly about the uh, components method that you, many of you started to discuss just a second ago when I asked the question. The reason you want to discuss it that way is that's probably the main way that you've done it in the past, not so much with the head to tail method. But why not? Why not use this method? It's hard to do. Yeah, you, you can't just slide your, your vectors around like I just did. There's another thing, too, in that it's, uh, it, it's not easy to get a very accurate answer because how accurate your answer is depends on how accurately you drew it all, right? So you would actually have to go in here with a ruler or something and measure the length of that third vector uh, in order to know what the magnitude was after adding these two things together. So there is a good reason why we want an, a more algebraic way to do this as opposed to a graphical way of doing it. And so that's what we're going to get into. Um, to do that, we need to talk about force components. Okay? So on these force components, what we're basically doing is something similar, but we're going backwards. We're, instead of uh, adding two forces together graphically, what we need to do is think about what if this force that I've showed on the page right here is two forces that have already been added together. Right? So I'm trying to think, I'm going to view that force that I've got on the page right there as already having been added together, and I'm going to constrain it one little bit more and say it was added together to the two things that were added together to get this force were directed along particular directions. One of those directions being here, and another direction being here. So let's say I've got x and y, and I want to specify that I had two forces, one along x and one along y, that when I added them together, I got f. Right? All right, well, that actually makes unique vectors. And that's what you're doing when you split a force into two components. You're actually taking something, you're saying, it does represent two things added together, but I'm going to split them back apart. Okay? And I'm going to do that so that I can find the component, let's say, that's in the x direction and a component that's in the y direction. And we a lot of times give these particular notations. Uh, very often we might call this fx and this fy, like this. All right, well, how do I figure out if I happen to know that f is my vector? And let's say I have another piece of information too. Let's say that I also know the, let's say, an angle like this. So I know the direction of the force. And I'll go ahead and put that as a angle theta. How do I go about finding what the magnitude of fx and fy are uh, if all I know is the magnitude of f and theta? Trigonometry. Trigonometry. It's good. I'm, I like that answer so much better then, well, it's just f cosine theta and, and y, you know, f cosine or f sine theta, right? I like that answer a lot better. What do you mean by trigonometry? Who said that? You said that. What do you mean by trigonometry? Okay. Right. So I think what you're saying is, let's kind of repeat this down here. Let's say I keep fx where it's at. But what I'm going to think about doing is uh, using the head to tail rule and put the tail of Fy on Fx. And we're saying those had better add up with the head to tail rule to F, right? So here's Fy, here's Fx. And because of how we picked X and Y, we also know that this is a right angle right here. And if that's a right angle, there are some trig uh, relationships that work on this triangle that are relatively simple. Like what? What is the definition of the sine function? Because this, remember, this right here is also going to be theta, right? So what's sine of theta? Opposite over hypotenuse. Fy over f. Great, right? Then what's Fy? F sine theta. 
Okay, what's the definition of the cosine of theta? Fx over f. So what's fx? F cosine theta. Okay, f cosine theta. Wonderful. We didn't have to memorize those, right? What did we memorize long, long time ago? Right? So, ka, toa. We learned the definitions of what the sine and the cosine functions are. And that's all you needed to know. Right? And the rest of it falls out of that. Okay, super. So that's, we can now split a force into components with these formulas or by just understanding that it's a, uh, just a right triangle and understanding what your trig functions are. Okay? What if, for some odd reason, I had, instead of, given, in, instead of giving you the uh, theta angle right there, let's say I gave you another angle, phi, and I measured it relative to the vertical axis as opposed to the horizontal axis. What does that do to my thinking? Okay. It changes the relationship a little bit, right? We still have F, we still have Fy, we still have Fx. For this triangle, let me move it a little bit further here out of the way. For this triangle, where's my angle? Okay, between Fy and F, he says. So there's an angle right here. How do I know that for sure? Okay, the diagram, but there's a, a, a geometric relationship that I'm sure all of you probably had drilled into your head uh, when you were in high school. That relationship is that when you have two parallel lines and you have another line that goes across like this, What's the relationship between alternate interior angles? They're congruent, right? Did you guys memorize something like that in high school? Well, that's exactly what we're doing here, right? That's how I know for sure that that is the angle phi that I drew on my triangle right there, okay? Well, that's good so far, and, uh, but what does that mean in terms of our uh, sine, cosine functions, just like I did on the last example? Okay, the sine function, sine of phi, is always the opposite over the hypotenuse. Well, what's the opposite side to angle phi? Fx, right? So this will be Fx over F, which means that Fx is going to be equal to F times the sine of Right? But I thought x was always associated with cosine. This is shaking me to the core. No, because there's something deeper, right? So katoa. Wonderful. All right, what about cosine? Fy over f. And that means that Fy is going to be equal to f cosine of phi. Okay, all really good stuff. Now let's actually throw another kink into it. We said earlier that uh, angle is not the only way that we have to measure the direction of a force. What's another way? Slope. So let's pretend for a second like we don't have uh, these angles anymore. And instead, let's think about a slope, which is still defined relative to our coordinate system, right? I'm saying how much of this slope goes along one of my coordinate directions and how much of it goes along the other coordinate direction. And uh, let me just write these out as being here's my run and here's my rise. Okay. Now let's think about this little uh, triangle right here and draw it with respect to the other triangles. So I'm going to give myself a little room right here and draw this uh, main like force vector triangle. 
where this is f and this is fy and this is fx and now I can take that little slope indicator and uh, kind of think about embedding it right here at this corner, right? Like this, where this is my rise and this is my run. And uh, what's the length of this other side of that little blue triangle? What does Pythagoras say? Okay, that's the length of that side over there. Now, what's the relationship between the blue triangle and the red triangle? They're similar, which means that your like sides uh, have the same ratios relative to one another, right? So what is, how do I use that? Okay, could I do something like this where I say F over the square root of rise squared, whoop, rise squared plus run squared, that should be equal to what? Something like fx over run. And if this is the case, I can rearrange this same equation and say that fx is equal to f times the run over the square root of rise squared plus run squared. All right, good enough so far? All right, well, what's, uh, what, do you th what else can we do here? F over square root of rise squared plus run squared is also equal to what? Fy over rise. And that can be rearranged to find Fy so that it is just F times the rise over the same radical that I had in my last uh, step. So square root of rise squared plus run squared. All right, my point here is that you can pick off components of a force uh, regardless of what kind of information you are given. You don't have to convert to an angle and then take trig functions of that angle if the information that you're given is slope information. You can directly use your slope information to find your components uh, fx and fy. This is actually going to become really important in our next lecture where we start looking at three-dimensional concurrent force systems because angles in three dimensions are much more difficult to work with than angles in two dimensions. It's not that you can't, it's just that they're more difficult to work with and uh, in most people's opinion, it's more convenient to work with a system that's much more similar to the slope kind of system that we're talking about here rather than trying to figure out the angles so much in the in the 3d kind of problems all right so it's one of the reasons i emphasize this a little bit all right well now we've figured out how to split things into components so what why do we care what is this useful for all right this is useful to help us add multiple forces together because now any force that we've got we can split it into components right so like my F1 that I have right here, I can think about splitting that into a component that goes horizontally and a component that goes vertically, right? And maybe I'll call that F1X and F1Y. Uh, can I do that for F2 as well? Okay, I can think about F2 as being a component here uh, F2 X and F2 Y. And why is that helpful? Right, you can add things together directly just with numbers 
just like we did way up at the very beginning where me and my son were pulling on here, we could just add those straight together because they were along the same line. Well, we now have that for both the x direction and for the y direction, right? So for the x direction, I can just take my f1x and add to it f2x, noting that one of those is going to be negative, right? So I would actually, it would kind of look like I'm subtracting, but I am adding them together. It just so happens they're in opposite directions, right? And then I can also add my y components together. And once I do that, what does it give me? Okay, a resultant. And here's, you know, I can, I can even kind of do that um, and show the graphical part of it, right? I can copy this. Okay, stick it right here. And what do I put on there as well? Okay, F2Y. Let me copy that. Stick it on here. And put it to the, you know, to the head of that one. And what about my x direction? Take F2x and I put it to the head of F1x like this. And now what I can do is I can think about, you know, my x coordinate is going to be somewhere in here and my y coordinate is going to be somewhere in here. You can see there that gets you the same result as the head to tail method, right? But that's ultimately what you're doing. And so you probably remember the formulas where you said, uh, you know, your x component of your resultant is going to be equal to, uh, you know, f1x plus f2x plus as many of those as you have. You have to take into consideration all of the different force component or force forces that are being applied. And then the y component of the resultant is equal to f1y uh, plus f2y uh, plus however many of those components there are. And then how do you come up with what the length is of the resultant vector? Okay. Keep in mind what I'm really talking about. Let me even get to a different color here. What I'm really talking about is a uh, kind of a force triangle that is this. Okay. What I have here is Rx. And what I have here is R y you can use the pythagorean theorem and say the square root of r x squared plus r y squared is equal to the magnitude of r okay what if i need the direction of my r vector and let's say I define that uh, with an angle relative to horizontal. And I'll call that theta r, let's say. How do I find theta r? OK. We remember Sokato again and say tangent of theta r is going to be equal to the opposite over the adjacent, where the opposite is ry. Right, that's opposite of where that angle is being measured. And the adjacent is Rx. This tells us then uh, that theta r is going to be the inverse tangent of Ry over Rx. Okay. Good stuff, right? Um, you guys have, have seen some examples like this, so I think I'm going to forego uh, a specific example on this particular point. But if you would like to see one, uh, I do have some videos from 122 you can watch where I do, you know, one or two of those kind of examples. I do want to get into the other whole area that matters to us in terms of 2D concurrent force systems. And that is the idea of equilibrium. Okay. Um, so with equilibrium, what we do is we actually hearken back to uh, Newton's second law. 
right? That's our starting point for thinking about equilibrium. What does Newton's second law say? Okay, we always think of it as F equals M A. But there's a little bit of extra particulars that it, we, if we put on here, we can get more out of it than just F equals M A. One of those particulars is that, hey, guess what? F is actually a vector quantity, right? What else is a vector quantity? A is also a vector quantity, right? The other thing I'm going to put on here that makes it a little bit e more easy to really understand how it typically works is that when we're talking about this F over here on the left, what we're actually talking about is an overall resultant force being applied to a body, right? We have to look at all the forces being applied to the body and, use, and look at that as a vector. That will be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of gravity of that body, right? So this is really, over here on the left side, even though we say it's F, that we can think of that as a resultant force of all the forces that are being applied to a particular body. And to help represent that, a lot of times people will put a sum symbol out in front of that F to say you got to add up all the forces acting on that body. And once you've done that, the way the body will accelerate is, is uh, you know, based on the uh, multiplying that by the mass. All right. So good so far. That actually gets to be really interesting when you get into a class called dynamics but I'm going to make your life a little bit less stressful and I'm going to tell you that this is a statics class. Okay? So since we're in statics, what do we get to do? Okay? We get to say we don't want to deal with a situation where the speed of anything is changing. Right? We're going to make it to where all of our speeds remain the same and and you know most of our problems it's even easier than that where we say we know for sure that the speed is saying the same because we can look at it right now and it's not moving at all and then I look at it a few seconds later and it's still not moving at all and I conclude it must have zero velocity now and later and later after that which means that acceleration is also equal to zero because the velocity is not changing right so Anyway, those are for the stationary type of problems that are, that's, you know, usually what happens in a statics class. But what we're talking about here is actually also useful even if you're talking about uh, bodies moving at a constant velocity. Okay? Well, if that's happening, then we get to do this. And if we get to do that, then what we're saying is if, if, if the velocity of, of everything is not changing, and that means that the sum of forces that are being applied to the body must be zero. And that's our condition for equilibrium that we call it. All right? But that's, there's more embedded into that equation than it looks like if you just look at it. Because a vector quantity involves both magnitude and direction. Right? So let's think of... Um, you know, a, a, here's a body, and here's a, a force being applied to the body. Okay, that's a vector quantity. And we're saying here that vector quantity has to be equal to zero. Well, what does a zero vector look like? Graphically. It looks like a point, right? And the way you know that is you kind of take the limit of it. You say, I could cut it in half and it gets shorter. I could cut it half and again, it gets a little bit shorter. You can see that it eventually basically becomes a point. Well, if I have this force of F, I could express that force of F in terms of two components, right? Like Fx and Fy. Well, what happens to Fx and Fy as F goes to zero? They also go to zero. They have to, right? So when I say sum of force, uh, sum of the force vector has to be equal to zero, what I'm really saying is that the sum of all the forces acting in the x has to be zero, and the sum of all the forces in the y also has to be zero. So 
that vector equation is not just one equation. It's actually multiple equations. If you're dealing in two dimensions, it's two equations. If you're dealing in three dimensions, it's three equations, right? Because if it was in three, if in three dimensions, you would also add a third one, right? OK, well, that's actually a super powerful tool for us to use, this condition for equilibrium and saying that our sum of forces in the x has to be equal to 0 and the sum of forces in the y has to be equal to 0. But we need a tool to help us fully utilize this. And the reason why is that we need to be able to make sure that we have accounted for all the forces acting on a particular body. And the tool that we typically use for that are these free body diagrams. Okay? The whole concept of the free body diagram goes back actually to Newton's first law. He says what? First law. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless outside forces act on it, right? So what we can do is we can start with that scenario and say whatever body we're thinking about trying to analyze, let's first get it isolated to where it's in that state where we know it's not accelerating. In other words, no forces are acting on it. And the way we do that is we picture it literally floating in space, right? So on this little problem over here where I've got this disk suspended by a rope and a link, right? What do you think the first step would be to trying to free a body to help us analyze, say, how much force is in the rope and how much force is in the link if you know the weight of the disk, for instance? What's the first step? The, the method is called, like we're, we're trying to draw a free body diagram. So the first step is to free the body, right? First step. And when you free the body, what are you doing? You're drawing it separate from everything else. That's why that's always the first step is you take your body. I've chosen the disc as my body that I'm going to draw the, the diagram of. And I draw it without the link and the rope. And also, in mentally, I've eliminated gravity as well at this stage, right? I've said, this is a disk. It's floating in space, all right? And we start there. And if that's what we've got, then we know it's not accelerating by Newton's first law, OK? What's our next step? OK, now we realize, OK, I, I, that took me some effort to get that thing free. And it's not really free. There are actually forces acting on it. So let's go back in and systematically put those on there. But instead of drawing it as a rope or drawing it as a link, let's draw them with force vectors. OK? So what would that look like? You know, maybe there's a force acting in the rope. Maybe I'll call that F sub rope. What else? Maybe there's a force acting in the link. And I'll put that on here. And I'll call that F sub link. Now, who has an idea as to why I p chose to draw the arrow uh, kind of downward and to the left for the rope and upward and to the right for the link? OK. He says, because the rope holds tension, whereas the link does not. And here's what he means, right? Uh, a rope, we know it has to hold tension. Why is that? You can't push a rope, right? It's, it's, that's true. You can't push a rope, right? You can only pull on it. Well, the effect of the rope on the disc, which is what we're trying to analyze here, therefore, it has to go away from the disc, right? That's the only thing the rope is going to be able to do to the disc is pull the, the uh, disc toward the location that the rope is anchored, right? That's why I drew the, the arrow that direction for the rope. And it's, a, it's an acknowledgment that there must be tension in that rope. What about the link? OK. The link can go either way, right? A link can hold tension, and it can hold compression, right? Um, 
and I know that it must just hold a force right along its, uh, its axis because it has a pin on both ends. And we'll get into that a lot more when we start talking about trusses. But uh, I know it's got a pin on each end, and therefore it can't uh, have any other action in it besides just a force along a line from pin to pin. Right? So that's why I drew that uh, F link like I did so that it lined up with um, the, you know, kind of a line that went from pin to pin of the link. Right? But I assumed a direction. I knew the line, but I assumed a direction like pointing toward the pin. And there's a reason I chose that. Um, although it, it may not be obvious at first glance, I know it has to be that direction to counter the leftward action of the rope. Okay, here's the thing. If you don't see that at first, it's not that big a deal. Why? Because if you get any of these directions wrong at this stage, you can still solve the problem, and the answers you get will tell you whether or not you were right as far as the directions that you chose for these uh, arrows. Okay, So that should be a comforting thing. All right, what other forces act on this body? Gravity. And what direction does that go? Okay, And I didn't tell you what the weight of the disk is, so let's just call it maybe W sub disk. Something like this. All right, am I done with my free body diagram? Someone says no, why not? OK. I think I heard someone say a reference frame. That is your job as an engineer to put that on your diagrams. Real things in real life very seldom come with x and y axes stuck to them. Right? It's your job to figure out what should my x and y axes be. And I'd say a lot of the time, they basically align with the direction of gravity. That's kind of a default thing to check and see if that would be a good uh, way to set up your axes. Okay. All right, what else should, do I need on my free body diagram? What's that? Okay, anything else you know about it, right? Do you know any kind of geometry or do you know any of the magnitudes of the forces? Anything else that you happen to know about the problem, go ahead and get it on there. So you guys mentioned the angles, right? So if I have this angle of theta that I'm showing right down here, um, I think the smoothest and kind of cleanest way to show that on this diagram is to show that angle right here. Okay, and the reason for that, again, is alternate interior angles. All right, do I know anything else? Ah, I can infer what the slope of the link is because I know how far it is horizontally from one pin to the other, and I know how far it is vertically from one pin to the other. That defines this line that goes from pin to pin which is the line along which the force acts, because it's just two pins and nothing else. right? And therefore, I can say what the slope is of this vector right here. right? And that slope is going to be h for the rise and w for the run. All right? And now at this point, since I don't actually have any more information uh, on the figure. I don't know any of my forces or anything like that. This is about as far as I can go. But what if I gave you one more piece of information? What if I gave you W disk? All right. Still not quite enough. Why not? I don't know W, H, or theta. What if I gave you W disk, W, H, and theta? Now you can figure out the other two forces, right? So um, we're not going to do that problem, but I, I wanted to mention what you need to do for, for drawing your free body diagrams is first free the body. That's the most common mistake I see people make is not freeing the body, all right? The point of that is making it very clear in your mind that the body is, you're, it, you're picturing it floating in space. And that way, all the forces you start adding to it, um, you can do them very methodically and you don't get yourself confused by adding a force and then trying to figure out whether that force you just added has been uh, 
you know, accounted for in some other way because something that still exists on your diagram, like another body that's still on the diagram or something. Does that make sense? All right, so we, we've now looked at equilibrium and how to draw free body diagrams. Let's do a problem. Okay. So now I have this block of material. It's 12 feet high. It's 5 feet wide. And there's a, uh, a face of the piece of material that basically slopes from one edge to the other. So there's this, you know, uh, face right here. Okay. The back of the block over here is aligned with the direction of gravity. And the bottom of the block is horizontal. What we want to do is find the force in the rope and the contact force between the disc and the block. Okay. What do we do first? Free the body. Free the body. Good answer. We got to free the body. Okay. Wonderful. I just freed the body. It's free. There's the disc. It's floating in space. No forces are acting on it. It's free. Now what? OK. You can go ahead and put the reference frame on if you want. What do you want to use as the reference frame? OK. I, I don't know of another good one besides, you know, you, there's other ones I guess you could use. But, you know, a really obvious one is just go ahead and line it up with the direction of gravity and horizontal. OK. So we'll go ahead and do that. And we'll use kind of a standard way of looking at that, where I look at the horizontal as being x and the vertical as being y. Now what? OK, you can start putting the forces that you removed, one of which is the force of gravity, right? So we'll put that on here. And because we aligned our axes with the direction of gravity, that one is going to align with that y-axis. And do we know the magnitude of it? Fifty pounds. Fantastic. What else? Okay, there will be a contact force here. And that contact force, um, you have to think about this a little bit to make sure that you understand how that contact force works. Let's look at it this way. Is there anything that, it, that is acting on this disc that is trying to make it rotate? Kind of a tricky question the way I asked it, I guess. Like, there's not an externally applied force or something acting on the disc, you know, trying to twist it. The, uh, the rope is acting at what appears to be the center of gravity of the disc, right? So it's pulling right in the middle. It's not necessarily having a rotational effect around the middle of the disc. A lot of these things come together to make me think there's probably no force acting this direction where the disc contacts the block. Okay. Now, if I wanted to make this absolutely simple and easy to feel good about that, I could say, hey, you know what? That's a greased surface <laughs> or something like that. A lot of your problems do something like that to say, you know, they give you this code word like this is greased or this is a smooth surface or something like that. What are you supposed to take from that? No friction. So if there's no friction, now what can you be sure of? There's no force that direction where the, where the disc touches the block. OK? Well, if that's the case, then what is the only force that I can have at that location where the disc touches the block? It's got to be perpendicular to where this contact is occurring. And because the disc is round, that means that that line is going to go right through the middle of the disc. OK, so I think of that line going right through the middle of this disk. Now, my next question is that, you know, that is the line of action that, I, that I'm going to have for the force acting between the block and the disk. Do I know anything about the direction of that line of action? 
Okay, well I do, it's perpendicular to this surface, right? Well, do I know the slope of this surface? What's the slope of the surface? A rise of 12 and a run of 5. Okay, does that mean that I know the slope of the perpendicular line to the surface? 5 over 12, right? And, uh, you know, you can either see that intuitively, which a lot of people will just immediately see that intuitively, that this will be a rise of 5 for a run of 12, right? Or if you're the kind that likes to remember math fact kind of things, uh, you might remember that whenever you had perpendicular lines in a coordinate plane when you were working in algebra, how did the slopes relate for those two perpendicular lines? Do you ever remember hearing something about they were negative reciprocals of one another? Okay, the negative part doesn't matter to us for this particular application. What matters to us is, yeah, they are reciprocals of one another, which means you basically just swap rise and run, and you end up seeing that there's this, uh, you know, a relationship between the surface and the perpendicular line to the surface. Okay, wonderful. That I can then copy over right to here. Right? It's got a rise of 5 and a run of 12. What do I do as far as the force between the disk and the block? Thoughts? Okay. Most of you, almost all of you are saying, you know, you probably know, just can easily tell, it's going to be some kind of a line that aligns with this line of action. What you all are probably working on is, what direction does the head of the arrow go? Okay, towards the disc. How do you know that? Okay. Okay, I like that. So to really fully understand this interaction, what you can do is imagine, you know, maybe over here I'll draw a block a little bit smaller, right? Here's the block. And if this is the force acting on the disk that I've showed over here, that means there's an equal and opposite force acting on the block, right? Those are just the two ways of looking at the same force. You can think of what is the effect on the disk or what is the effect on the block. Right? And since we're looking at a free body diagram of the disk, I want to look at the effect on the disk. Right? And that's why I drew the force toward the disk. It wouldn't make any sense for the block to be pulling on the disk. Right? The block has to be pushing on the disk. And that's why I draw that arrow that direction. Okay? All right. What else should I write on here? Okay? I should show here the force from the rope, something maybe like this. All right, good so far. What else should I put on here? The angle, okay. I've got this 35 degree angle relative to vertical right here. How do I show that on my diagram? Okay, so I think maybe what you're saying is it would go right here. All right. Still missing a couple things on here. What else should I put on here? The height of the wheel. Okay. What am I trying to solve for? The force in the rope and the contact force between the disc and the block. It would sure be nice if I had variables that represented those two items, right? Like what? You get to make it up, right? You get to say what those are going to be, but I like to make them up in such a way as they kind of tell me what they are, right? So maybe something like uh, F rope, or sometimes I even put something like T rope. Why do you think I use the letter T sometimes? Tension. Tension. When I use the letter T, that leaves no doubt as to what direction I'm assuming is positive, right? It says, I'm assuming this is a tension value, 
right? What else? Okay, like maybe F contact or something like that. You can do either way. So the question was, can, do you have to label it as 50 pounds, or could you label it as weight? Or you know, the answer is you can do it however you want, as long as you've defined enough information so that you can, you know, like if you've said somewhere else that weight equals 50 pounds, then you can just label weight on there, and, it's, and you're good to go, right? So um, yeah, good question. Great. Well, there's our free body diagram. Isn't it beautiful? Quick tip for you. Um, Drawing these in color, especially when you're first learning how to do them, but I think like all the time, is really helpful. Why do you think? Yeah, you're drawing arrows all over the place, right? How do you know which arrow is a coordinate axis versus which arrow is a force, right? Well, if you have a color code like this, it makes that a little, little easier to decipher. Right, so uh, that's not a requirement. It's just a little tip that says, I think you'll end up understanding this a lot more quickly if you uh, use some kind of a help for yourself like that, like a, like a color code for all of your lines and such. You're welcome to copy the color code I use if that's helpful. All right, you can tell here, basically what I usually do is uh, I use red for forces, I use black for bodies, I use blue for things like reference frames and dimensions most of the time, and then green for other stuff in case I want it, All right? Actually green, uh, whenever I teach a class that involves dynamics, usually green are my motion vectors, All right? And so if that's helpful for you, you're certainly welcome to copy my uh, color code, but um, if not you, not, you don't have to. All right, what, what do we do with a free body diagram? Okay, you can use it to write equilibrium equations, and those equilibrium equations can often be used to find the things that you're trying to find, okay, which are often the unknown forces, but don't have to be. What does that look like for this example? Which equation would you like to write first? Okay. Sum of the x's, I think I heard. All right. So let's sum up all of the forces that I have in the x direction. And I tell you what, I'll put a heading over the top of this. I'm about to do equilibrium equations. This was my free body diagram up here. And that's, this is basically the flow you should try to follow every single time. All right. Now, what does my x equation look like? Okay. So T rope is one of them. What direction does T rope Tip, you know, generally pull when you compare it to the x. Negative, right? Because it's coming to the left, right? And I define to the right to be positive. So let me say I've got minus t rope, but I don't want the entire value of t rope, right? I only want the component of it that points in the horizontal direction. Okay. Okay. So a couple of suggestions were just given. Um, I'll show you what I like to do is I like to think of this, you know, as being something I can split into components just like this. And I'm trying to find that component down there. Where's, where's my uh, 35 degrees if I look inside that triangle? This is my 35 degrees, right? Okay. And T rope is the length of the hypotenuse side, right? And I'm trying to find this opposite side to where that 35 degrees is in my triangle. So how do I, you know, if I want to just directly find that, what do I multiply T rope by to get that other side? 
the sine because sine is always associated with the opposite side. So Katoa, right? So T rope times the sine of what? 35 degrees. Okay. What other forces do I have that have components in the X direction? F contact. Does it point generally rightward or leftward? Rightward. So I'm going to say plus F contact. And I only want the horizontal component, right? I only want the component that goes along the X. So what do I do? Okay. Remember up here, what did I what did I draw right here? Notice here, I'm trying to find uh, the x component in this first part, and I used the run, which is the one that's aligned with that direction, right? So down here, the way that actually practically works out is I would put this as 12 over the square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared. Okay, and those of you who are versed in Pythagorean triples say that that's going to be 13. Square root of 12 squared plus 5 squared equals 13. May or may not have been on purpose. Okay. Okay, good. So he made the comment, the weight of the disc has no X component. Right, so that doesn't need to be in this equation. And so that means we are done. So those are the only three forces involved in this problem. All right, what next? Okay, so in the Y direction, I'm gonna do them in the same order. Does T rope generally point upward or downward? Upward, which I've defined as being positive. So I'm going to count that as a positive T rope. But I only want the vertical component of it, right? Just the part that points straight up. How do I pick that off? What do I need to multiply by to pick that off? Cosine of 35 degrees, which one way you know that is that we used sine before, and so it better be cosine. But the other way you can tell is that what we're trying to pick off is this vertical part right here, and you can tell that it is adjacent to where that 35 degree angle is measured. And cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So, so Katoa coming into action once again. All right, so there's that. What about F contact? Okay, multiplied by 5 over 13, he says. Okay. And the reason you know that is that you're taking that piece of the slope indicator that goes the direction you're trying to pick off, and you're dividing by what is essentially the hypotenuse length of the slope indicator. Okay. What else? Subtract off the 50 pounds, then that's it. So now we have a system of two equations in two unknowns. All right. And once you get to this point, you rejoice because you have a piece of technology at your disposal that makes this easy. All right. Your FE approved calculator, which may or may not look like that. You can plug this stuff straight into that calculator and not even have to work too hard to get the answers to this. So let me show you that real quick. If you have a Casio, here are your keystrokes. Uh, first of all, you need to get into equation mode. So you touch the mode key and number five right there gets you into this menu. All right, 
and it's not necessarily immediately obvious unless you kind of look at it for a second, but the first entry in there is a two equation, two unknown system that it can solve for you. The next entry there is a three equation, three unknown. Next is a quadratic equation, and the last one's a cubic equation. So we just want number one. And what you enter here are the coefficients of your equations. So for our first equation, what is the coefficient of t rope? Negative, negative sine of 35 degrees, right? So check real carefully, too, to make sure your calculator degree mode, right? It is. So I'll just put here negative sine of 35. Okay. What's the coefficient of F contact? Okay. 12 over 13. Positive, right? Now, for the last one, um, this needs to be the constant term that's not multiplied by any uh, variable, right? And for this one, this is easy. You just put in 0. We'll have to talk about the next one a little bit. All right, next we need to put in the coefficient for t rope in the second equation, which would be cosine of 35 degrees. Then we're going to put in the coefficient of F contact in the second equation. And that would be 5 thirteenths. Now, this is the one that's a little trickier. If you look real carefully at the format that it gives you in the menu we came from just a second ago, it shows you that the value that it wants for C is not on the left side of the equal sign. It's on the right side of the equal sign. The way we have ours written, where do we have ours? on the left side of the equal sign. And so if we want to actually get this into the format it's looking for in the calculator, we would move that 50 pounds to the other side, right? Which would basically make a positive 50 pounds once we move it to the right side of the equation. And so instead of putting a negative 50 pounds right here, I'm going to put positive 50. Once we've got all that in there, we hit equals. Right? Um, X was what? T rope, right? That was the first variable that I was putting in coefficients for. Right? So I would say that the force in the rope is 47.25 pounds or so. And what about F contact? Twenty nine point three six. And we have our answers. Okay. All right. So again, that was mostly review. Um, this is our one day of review. Figured I'd get all of our juices flowing today. Uh, I believe the homework isn't that much harder than this, if any. Um, so get to it. There are a good number of problems on this first set, just to make sure you're all these review things uh, you're still comfortable with and everything. And so get to work on that. And I will see you next week.